Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers from the big city. Sweating the small stuff. And we're live at BYU. <laughs> yeah. All right. I was a little worried. I was hoping that you guys would yell out there. <laughs> yeah. That we didn't instruct them to do that. They did that voluntarily. Um, but yeah, we're super excited to be here. We just flew in uh, just a couple of hours ago. And it's beautiful. We haven't seen mountains in like, I, I don't know. When's the last time you saw a mountain? I, well, actually kind of recently. Oh, yeah. You were out here doing Colorado skiing. <laughs> yeah. Trip. But, uh, but no, I don't know how you guys get any work done. I mean, I would just be like staring at the mountains all day. Uh, yeah, I'd be hiking and everything. But uh, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous campus. And we really appreciate you, go, you guys hosting us. Yeah. This is uh, our, what is our third live podcast ever? Yeah. Third live Lucky podcast. Lucky number three. Yeah. BYU. Yeah, we just did the. Uh, we just had dinner at the Women in Design. Yes. Uh, conference, and yeah, we listened to some amazing speakers. Some really inspiring talks. Um, yeah, like uh, we just listened to like Mariah Hay talk about like uh, UX, UI, and just leadership in general. That yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Rebecca Fennell. Yeah. Who who is a, a serial entrepreneur and designer. And uh, I had no idea she was sitting at our table and was super low key about it. And then she went up and I was like, oh, my gosh, I've admired your work since college. Yeah, she had she had started a baby product company. Yeah, called Boone. And you had applied. Right? I applied. I'm pretty sure I get an interview. I'm pretty sure I called them up uh, and, and they were like, please stop calling here. <laughs> um, and yeah. And then uh, also Suzanne. Uh, Ode Hagel or Us Hengel, who is apologies currently in the, the audience, apologies cringing the, as we <laughs> as we mispronounce her name. Uh, but yes, check her out. Uh, knit knitwear specialist uh, does a lot of footwear stuff. Um, really beautiful work. Yeah, at Suzanne dot Ode Hengel. We'll put it. We'll put it in the description. You'll, yeah. you'll be able to check it out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> People um, can mispronounce it at home. Um, but yeah, I. James, it's it's been a while because you know I've been traveling. Yeah. And last podcast, Reed filled in for my spot. Which, by the way, I'll sh- shout out. Thank you to Reed for being the the uh, visiting co-host. Yeah. For last week, uh, I think you guys did a great job. Thank you. I also think you guys shouted out like thirty-seven. Oh people. yeah. <laughs> you know me, I, James, and, and Reed is just an enabler you, yes. of my shouting outness. I always, I always subdue your shouting outness because <laughs> you know shout, shout outs are great, but like we gotta. We gotta right, go I, I know I gotta, that was my I shout out schedule. episode. I got a schedule. I gotta go. I was like, Nick's away. Now's my <laughs> chance to shout out every des- every designer I've ever met in my life. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, I've been I've been traveling around, man. Yeah, I've noticed you've picked up a few accents. Yeah, I've, uh, I they're not they're not I don't I don't hear them, but <laughs> I hear them clearly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was in uh, Milan, Italy, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. This is your first time in Milan. It's really exciting, and I will say, like, it was a crazy fun experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I had always gone to New York Design Week and. I had, you know, really enjoyed that. And Milan is like four or five times as big as New York Design Week. Yeah. You know, they have the big... And a lot more Italians. Yes, more Italians, more Italians, yeah. a lot more coffee, a lot more... It's, I'm so surprised about how many people smoke in Italy. Mm. You know, I'm not a smoker, but like, it's just in America... So how much did you smoke? <laughs> I didn't smoke anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, in America, we have jewels, right? Oh, yeah. Everyone jewels over here. Yeah. And I was at this uh exhibition and there was a jewel like installation and i was talking to my friend i was like oh isn't this fu-? she was polish so she, she was in the european scene and i was like oh isn't this funny this jewel installation and she was like what's a jewel and it just blew me away because i feel like in america everyone knows what jewels are right it's like the e-cigarettes yes we're tech forward with our nicotine consumption yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> uh but yeah it's just i i met up with a ton of awesome people um I even met up with the BYU crowd. Josh was showing off, and a few other students were showing off their uh, chocolate sculptures and all kinds of fun stuff. Chocolate sculptures? Did you bring enough for the, in- for uh, the is there, is audience? there any more chocolate left, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I met up with, like, hung out with a bunch of designers, hung out with, like, visibility guys, talked to them, Jamie Wolfond. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. 
who else was oh uh antonio is he's another instagram guy mm -hmm. uh he met me the first day i was there and also thank you guys i know as some of you guys are listening right now i really appreciate you guys just like like showing me around the city yeah because i had no plan i just showed up and i was just like hey someone hang out with me yeah <laughs> Um, That's so yeah, awesome. Like, I had Steven help me around and he took me to like this lake thing. Um, did you, did you, uh, did you say MX? Oh yes. I met Marius Kindler. Yeah. The German uh, Instagram sketcher. MXVXRS something like that. <laughs> I can never <laughs> remember his handle, but uh, yeah. he was a cool guy. Yeah. yeah. We just hung out, had dinner, talked about Instagram life <laughs> as Instagrammers do, I guess. <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. I definitely want to go back. What were what were the highs and what were the lows? I really liked there was this whole street of installations in Italy. Mm. Um, I forget the name. It's like, Vent you know, it's Ventura. Installation Centrale Street. Or, yeah, Installation yeah. Street. Um, and so it was a bridge and it had arches under the bridge. Wait, the street was a bridge? The street was next to a bridge okay, or an overpass or something. Or maybe there's a street above. I don't know. You're getting too technical, James. <laughs> there was a bunch of arches, and in each arch was a different installation. Oh, So, cool. you know, there was a bunch of companies that did it, like Free Tag and uh, Benjamin Hubert did his installation with those, like, uh, glass spheres. Yeah. And sh he shined light on them, and it kind of looked like water. I mean, that was cool. Um yeah, there was uh, also another installation where they had, like, spotlights that mimicked your movement. So you could get up on stage and, like, start dancing. And yeah. then across the stage was a bunch of spotlights that were, like, kind of moving as you moved, mm. which was cool. Very cool. But, yeah, it was all kind of, like, conceptual and, you know. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. And then and then I flew over to Portugal. Yes. That was part of the trip uh, to speak at Ened, which was a, a design conference there, which I didn't really know that. I, I I was just really surprised about how many designers were that, at that conference. Yeah. Um, it was, I guess, the entire, all the design schools in Portugal come together once a year to have a conference. Um, so, yeah, I met with so many, like, Portugal students and Portuguese students, and it was just, like, amazing to, to see all these designers. That, yeah. You know, I feel like in America we tend to get siloed in our bubble sometimes. And we don't realize that there are other countries with completely different perspectives on design mm. and like completely different angles. Did you, what were some of those angles that you were exposed to? If you could describe them. This was actually, I think we talked about it on a podcast one time. Um, one of the speakers at this conference did musical instruments, designed musical instruments. Uh, like a, he designed a trumpet and built a trumpet it it looks like a normal trumpet, but I guess you have to be very particular about like the tonal frequencies and right. things because if it's if it doesn't have a certain frequency, it's not technically a trumpet. Huh. So like he talked about designing trumpets and it, which is like crazy. Like right. I think we talked about that one I time on a podcast. Yeah, I think I think it's something that we've also been talking about as as a topic is like especially when it comes to musical instruments, there's there's such a history to them. And it's crazy because you see these instruments that are like a saxophone. Right. Like looking at a saxophone, no industrial designer today would arrive at what a saxophone is right. now. But but it's still like a beautiful instrument in, in, in its own way. It's almost like <laughs> a saxophone is almost like if you took an iPhone and just like ripped the screen off of it and that was the iPhone. Exactly, yeah. It's like, you know, like the skin very, job like of the saxophone functional. got lost. Yeah. Right. Somewhere along the along the way, so that was interesting. It's just like those kind of things are really unique. Yeah, and then also I met uh, another designer in Portugal that was speaking. It was Guido Venturini. Yeah, who works for Alessi, mm. a designer for Alessi. Which right. I know you're a big fan of Alessi, James. I am. Uh, he he worked with Stefano Giovanoni oh. on on. I believe we mentioned this plate on the podcast. It's the plate that has all the little uh, people. With, with the little people cut out? Yeah, the people cut out. It's like the, the top selling Alessi product of all time. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was cool to talk with him. Yeah. It's actually really interesting because I was like, how did you get into Alessi? I mean, obviously we all want to- <laughs> How we did all wanna, you get in? We all, Show me on this map. We all want to have a license uh, of the office. with Alessi, right? <laughs> um, and, yeah, and, he, he, and how did he get in? So he told me the story when he graduated, uh, 
he started doing brooches, like just like jewelry. Mm. And he made a few, and he went to this, uh, I guess, show and showed them off, and then people started buying them. Yeah. And he kind of started expanding into fashion hmm. for a little bit, yeah. which then funded his real passion, which was design. Mm-hmm. So he you know, sold all these brooches, sold this jewelry, made some money, and then went home. And for, I believe he said five years, he made little models because they don't have, they didn't have like 3D CAD or Keyshot or anything. Right. He made little models and then he just took photos of them. And then he built up this entire portfolio book. And then since he, he's an Italian designer and he's the, his school that he graduated from was well connected with Alessi. And so Alessi came and he got connected to have a meeting with Alessi. And so he just sat down with him and showed him the book of all these little models that he made. Huh. That's so, so cool. It was interesting. It's interesting to hear the story of like him just kind of like bootstrapping, like making these little brooches just so he can make money. Right. Because I feel like from is it what brooch? I... Is brooch a tr- thing that you put yeah. in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not brooch. Bro- brochet. Brochet. Okay. It's, it's actually pronounced brochure. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, no, that's really interesting because I know that like when Stefano Giovanoni and I'm assuming this guy started working at Alessi, Alessi was just getting into plastics because they had, they were traditionally more of a metal company mm. and they were just starting to get into plastics. And that's when all of these sort of like characters emerged from their work because yes. their work is very character driven, I yeah. would say. And, and definitely Guido designed a few of the characters. I don't think those were as famous as the plate that he helped Stefano with, but yeah. um, Yeah. I mean, it was amazing trip just like seeing all these people and like getting to meet everyone. Like, I don't know. I've met like so many people and I don't know. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Now I'm back. That's amazing. (laughs) What have you been up to James? Uh, not a lot. Just been hanging out? Yeah. I've just been hanging out. Did you miss me? Yes. Uh, I did. Um, but uh, I mean, not too badly, like the the right amount. Just the I right would amount. Say. Got it. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the the biggest update that I have is I guess this coming Tuesday, Reach Lego and I are going to be doing um, this live stream for uh, MakerBot. So they've just launched their new printer, the MakerBot method, and we've we've done collaborations with MakerBot in the past. Um, and you guys are doing the live stream about your forum families. Correct? Yes. Okay. So we're going to be, we're going to be showcasing the forum families, how you can integrate that into your process. Um, and that's Tuesday. That's this coming Tuesday. So that will be tomorrow when this podcast is. Released. Yes. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So yeah. Uh, that's so exciting. That'll be fun. Cool. cool. Um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much it for the weekly updates, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm back. You're back. I'm back. Now we're at BYU. Yes. And tomorrow, they're doing a portfolio review. Yes, I saw that. So we thought. And I know that there are people in this audience right now working on their portfolios. (laughs) (laughs) We can see them. Um, So we thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about what is the best way to take a critique. Yeah. Or just talk about critiques in general. Yeah. Portfolio critiques, project critiques. Because they can be rough in the beginning. Yeah, for sure. Have you ever had a bad critique? Uh, you know, we've been talking about doing this topic, and I and I've been thinking about it, and I, and I've I've certainly had bad critiques before, or crit- like, oh, I will. Oh, so okay. So here's one. Has a professor ever snapped something that you made? No. Did they do that to you? And I'll I'll tell my story after yours. Okay. Um. <laughs> I, I'm i trying to remember if I had any like particularly bad critiques in school, but especially in the professional world, there was, there was one meeting when I was at Quirky as an intern and I was put in charge of a, of a small project. Okay. And I was up in front like presenting to the CEO and it was clear to him and everybody else in the room that it, like I hadn't done enough work on the concepts and he was like, are you even interested in this? And I was, I was horrified. Oh. It, it, was, it was a really rough moment. And, you know, 
I was very thankful because I, I feel like other designers on the team kind of advocated for me and for the project. And so I was able to take that critique and my manager, Julia Troy, kind of pulled me aside and was like, you need to become like a pseudo expert in this, you know, and, and just really be able to talk about it well. Right. And, you know, it was, it felt, it was a moment where I felt really dumb because I felt like I had learned that in design school. And I don't know if you've encountered this, but sometimes you kind of have to like relearn the lessons that you, that you should have learned. For sure. And, and it's like, it's even harder the second time around because you're like, I should have known that. I should I shouldn't be making these mistakes. Oh, well, I just made that mistake this past month. I uh, I was working on my my weight 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 project. Yeah, and the silicone did not cure, and so I wasted like you know uh, ten hours of work on on nothing. Oh no! And one of the uh, tips that we learned in shop class was to always test everything right before you do the entire batch yeah and yeah i didn't test because i was just like oh it's fine actually i didn't even think about it i was like oh yeah you just mix the two together pour it together right should be fine yeah um but yeah always test always test but yeah i mean i while that moment was really uncomfortable i also tend to get fueled by moments like that because i'm like i I have, I've been smacked down to like the, the rock bottom and now like I get to climb my way back up and it's going to, it's going to be great when I'm able to go up and present again and present in a way that's compelling and that I actually care about this thing. And, and that's essentially what I did. And I advocated, you know, I really got immersed into the material. So it was this toy and there's actually... Funny enough, there's a YouTube video still on YouTube of me describing the process behind this toy. And we'll link to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is James, what, uh, eight years ago, seven years ago? Oh, my gosh. I'm so ready so to handsome. see this video. So handsome. Um, uh, it's only gone, gone downhill, but <laughs> that's just from all the brutal critiques. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think that that was a case where I just – I. I knew exactly what I had done wrong in the moment. Yeah. And that was like, I need to... Those, ha- those days happen. Yeah, absolutely. I, but, uh, oh, yeah. Nick, wh- who snapped your model? Well, I don't think... I'm trying, I'm trying to think if I had a professor that... I don't think I've had a professor that ever's broken a model. But I've definitely had professors that have critiqued to the, like, nth level. Mm. Um, you know, I, I had the shop class again. The shop class was kind of the first design class we had um i mean it's not even design class it was just shop it was like build stuff yeah but of course we like to make it look nice so we designed it as well yeah um great shop professor like very like by the book and like really strict yeah and our first project was to i don't know if i've mentioned this story on the podcast have i i'm not sure but keep going. I'll, I'll just keep going keep going uh our first project was to carve uh objects out of foam and they had to be real objects, so we weren't really designing. We were just, like, mimicking real-life objects. Mm-hmm. And we had to do 15 of them, and I believe we only had a weekend to do it. And, of course, everyone was in there just, like, you know, sanding away and making these models. And then you also had, like, the slackers. There was, there was, I remember this, <laughs> there was this one. I, I don't know what happened to this poor guy, but uh, <laughs> critique morning comes around. Everyone has their models out. Yeah. He didn't do them. He goes over to the trash can, picks out all the scrap pieces, and then just starts quickly like just roughing them up and putting them on the on his desk. Honestly, I don't even think he should have shown anything. Right. That's worse than <laughs> worse than nothing, right? Uh, I would just love that, to jump into that kid's head in that moment of like what was what was his thought process? I don't know. I don't know. I, I that's a tangent. Yeah. That, that's a tangent on my story. But the professor walks up. And we're all around, and we we get there to the first uh, student's work. And, you know, it was, like, good. Like, it wasn't great. There was definitely much better work around, but it wasn't the worst. Um, and so, you know, this, this student presents their work, and everyone is like, you know, oh, good job. Mm-hmm. And everyone, everyone, like, gives the clap. Just like, to, just like the normal, like, good, good job, golf. you finished. Yeah. And the professor's like, no. No one, <laughs> no one claps. 
<laughs> unless you think they did a good job. Ooh. And, and so, like, everyone was, like, really silent. And so the next person goes, and, and their, their work was definitely not good. Oh, no. And it was just dead silence. Nobody clapped. And, uh, it was so bad. Cause, well, how cause, long until, cause, until cause there somebody was a few, got applause? The, no, there was a few that people that would applaud. And Did they the, get to you and everybody was like, <laughs> yeah, like carried you out on I, their shoulders? It wasn't, it wasn't silent for me. I did have applause, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was definitely tough because this was like the first class we took and the first project we had that was critiqued really hard. And I remember just like seeing some of the students like where it was just dead silent and you could just see their face just like, Oh no, that's rough. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's a a good story or not, Yeah, but that's just like one of the moments I remember. (laughs) I think, you know, I think in those moments you learn though, that the important thing about these projects is that it's a learning experience and you need to be able to separate those projects from from your own personal self. yeah right and i feel like that's really the key to taking a, a good critique yeah and that's a, it's a difficult thing to do and and sometimes honestly the best way to get over because i you know i i would take critiques very hard when i was a student and and even sometimes now like it's tough to internalize something yeah and I think the more that you expose yourself to criticism and and see it as nothing but it's like it's essentially it's essentially just like strengthening your argument like this is this is a way what what's a I'm trying to think of the analogy of like the like you you pound on something and it actually like the forge yes the forge or silly putty does that you know (laughs) Or, or that the cornstarch. If you've it? ever forged silly putty, <laughs> well, you know. Wait, you what, know. What, what do you call ublek? When you take a hammer, ublek. That's what it's called. Ublek. <laughs> you know ublek. You yeah. mix cornstarch and water, and you like. Yeah. <clears throat> I I have an, I do have another story to tell. Um, uh, silly putty and ublek aside, uh, I um. So I will say that during school. So here's here's something that I've stated on the podcast before, but. If you haven't heard the podcast, you haven't heard this. I didn't have a single industrial design internship until I graduated from college, which was, I mean, I was, I was very scared. I was very scared leaving college thinking like, will, will I be able to work in this industry? Um, and part of the reason for that is because I was so afraid of sending out a portfolio that somebody would see and and just be like this is this is terrible like Mm. i i would just constantly be working on my portfolio and never send it out uh like i would send it out at like the the like the last minute the minute where they're like oh and we just hired our intern yeah you know and uh and that that's been like that's been something that i've honestly had to work on even with like my personal work is just like when you don't have a real deadline, like how do you create that deadline for yourself and how do you stick to those deadlines? I don't know. Sometimes sometimes I almost feel like you need to stay up all night even for your own deadline. For your own personal projects. I mean, it's, you know, like sometimes it feels like it needs to go to that extreme in order for like somebody who was like me or, you know, to, to be able to finish my work and just get it out there. On the other end, on the other side of that equation, I um, I had, I had met this professional who had come come to visit the school, and like had a conversation with him. It was really great, and he went you know back to his firm, and like a co- I think it was maybe a year later. I was looking for an internship, and I really liked his studio, and so I had this relationship with him, and I was like, could I send you some of my thesis work to check out? Was and it he was, finished yet? Or were you no, still working on it? I was still working okay. on it. And he's like, yeah, but don't worry about formatting it or anything. And I literally, all I did was like, I just like scanned all these pages and sent them, like didn't even look at them. And like realized later that some of them were like upside down and all of this stuff. And he sent me back like the most like cutthroat email of like, don't waste my time. And I like, I pretty much like at the end of my thesis, I sent him my thesis book and he was like, this is, you know, this is great. Like, you know, 
uh, like great work. You've come a long way <laughs> since scanning upside down pages. Dang. But that's like the other side of things of like, of like not putting in enough effort in sending something out. Yeah. I mean, I mean the whole, the whole idea with the portfolio is that yes, it's never going to be finished. The only, the only time your portfolio is finished is when you're dead. <laughs> right it's true uh just being real here it's true just being real i've heard designers often hand over their portfolios right before they die (laughs) it's finished exactly exactly uh it is a little bit it's a little bit of a gamble because i know that a lot of times you're in this moment of like Oh, let me just fix this one last little project. Then I'll send it out to this yeah. company. But you know, you you really need to just shoot it out there. I I feel like if you send out your portfolio and it gets rejected, that's fine. Keep working on it mm-hmm. and then send out a version two. I don't think it's bad to keep sending versions. Yeah. Um. Or or if you have a new project that you put in there, I think that's okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some practical advice for the um, portfolio review tomorrow is... Oh, I have some. I have some. Oh, you have some. Uh, I I have some You're locked and loaded. I have have a pet peeve. Oh, you have a pet peeve. Well, I don't know what your advice was. Well, no, I want to hear your pet peeve first. Well, so I've, you know, I've now graduated and uh, reviewed, gone back to schools and reviewed portfolios. And... My biggest pet peeve is when I'm sitting there with someone and reviewing their portfolio and they're just like nodding like, oh, yeah, that's good. Good. Good job. Not doing anything. Don't, not writing anything not down. Not writing anything down. Mm. Not typing anything out. Not having mm. any sort of record of our, my meeting. And I'm being very particular like, oh, hey, like, you know, take out this random graphic that you have in here because it's right. just graphic design or whatever. And, yeah. Um, I'm. I'm. I'm telling them all these specific things and they're not writing anything down. Hmm. And I stop and I'm like, are you, are you not like, I'm not going to review your portfolio unless you're going to record this. Right. Because they're not going to remember <laughs> what I was saying. Right. That's I my w- biggest pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> you better write this, uh, these people's feedback down. Whether, th- whether you care, whether you think they're right or not, they're giving you their time and you need to acknowledge that. That's interesting. It almost makes me wonder that, you know, because I would get my portfolios printed on really nice paper. It almost makes me wonder, like, print it out in, like, packet form so that you can actually, like, mark down as this person's talking to you. Yeah. Or just, like, a paper that you don't care about. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's too much. But also, if that, you're presenting I mean, that, it on an iPad or something, like, you can write notes into it there, maybe. That's that's a good that's a good thought. Like, if you, are getting, if yeah. you know that you're going to get your portfolio critiqued, yeah. you can make, like, a dummy, like, cheap eight and a half by 11 copy paper. Oh, like a, a, like a good copy and then a dummy copy. Yeah, just to like review to, it. To write on to. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. That's good. Huh. I, <laughs> write that down. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, I think the last portfolio review I did at Virginia Tech, I don't know that I had a notebook on me. Wait, th- were you being reviewed I, no, or I was were you being, were reviewing? I was being reviewed. And you didn't write down their feedback, yeah, James? Yeah, I'm <sighs> such a jerk. That's why I didn't get any jobs. That's, that's why. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, um, no, that's really, I think that that could be really effective, uh, in terms of documenting that whole process. Um, yeah, I was just trying to think of like, if, if I'm to put myself in the shoes of somebody who goes into this portfolio review tomorrow and maybe the critiques of their portfolio, you know, are, are, you know, very critical, upsetting, uh, you know, what have you like, how do I recommend dealing with that and like what feedback to take seriously and what feedback, like, should you take all feedback seriously? I mean, that's, that's definitely a good point to make as well. Um, I mean, this even expands that beyond just portfolio. I think, you know, I, I, we post our work online yeah. a lot and we definitely get feedback and critique on it. And I don't really know how I handle when I get critique from someone and it's, you know, it's critical, maybe negative, And then I click on their profile <laughs> and 
they either have nothing related to design. Right. You know, they don't even have a website or anything. Yeah. Or they do have design, but it's very poor, in my opinion, that right. you know, they, they really don't know design. Yeah. You know, how do you... I mean, I think at, at some point, like, I always look at feedback objectively and, like, take it away from my, my myself and, like, oh, are they really saying something that's important? Like, yeah. yes. But other times it's, like, what 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 value is your opinion if you... Like, if Dieter Rams came in and was, like, change this, I'd be like, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> change. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one... W- one thing that comes to mind is that if you keep hearing the same things over and over, because I, I imagine with sure. this portfolio review, you might be it might be sort of a speed dating scenario. Mm-hmm. So if you're hearing the same critiques over and over, probably that's, that's means important. that there's something to change there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty low, uh, low hanging fruit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that. You have to, somebody, somebody said to me, I, I was talking to them about coming out to BYU and, and talking about how to take critiques. And they were, they said, choose which hill you're willing to die on. Like that was, that was like their, their big takeaway. What, what does like, that mean? Specifically? That, I think that means, I think that's more project based. And when you're presenting your work and it's like, what are you willing, what are you willing to change? And like, what are you like what are you steadfast about like what are you what do you think is important here mm. and what's what's what are you willing to give up like what are you willing to say you don't know like in in that situation of just a general critique yeah i mean i think there's also the one thing that's kind of hard with a critique is that a lot of times it's just kind of a critique as a whole like it might even be critiquing the actual project itself right and also the presentation mm. it, you know like ha- if you have a project that maybe isn't that great and you could either improve the presentation to make it like, oh, it's a good project mm. or scrap the whole project and, I don't know, redo it. I, yeah. I mean, that, I guess that's on a case-by-case basis. Yeah. I don't know. It Part of me almost feels like you need to have this sort of like inner circle of trusted advisors you know, like whether it be your peers in your class or. Do you think so, though? I feel like when you have a lot of fr- like you guys need to find good friends who will tell you the truth. Yeah. Because that's no, that's, that's what key. I'm talking about. Like the, the friends that will tell you how it is. Yeah. OK. Like like I will say that Reed Schlegel, you know, he and I went to school together. Reed will tell it like it is. Yeah. And like that has been very valuable in our relationship. Like. You know, and I will do the same to him. It's like, that's, I think it's a sign of respect for one another that we would tell each other the truth about our work. Yeah, you know? that's true. Uh, yeah, I think as designers, I guess we understand that more. Yeah. Definitely, I feel like your mother's critique might not be as helpful. Cause she'll be like, <laughs> oh, honey, this is so good. This is great. She's not in the inner circle, Nick. Yeah, okay. Your okay. mom, your mom is in my inner circle of critiquers, <laughs> but not, not, not my mom. Have you talked to her lately? I haven't talked to her lately. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any last thoughts on on critiques? Uh, I think I don't know. I mean, it's it's easy. It's easy enough to say. Oh, he's got I have, it. I have an, he's I have got thought, it. I have a thought. He's got it. Um, I I just encourage there to be, you know, you just need to be able to set. You, it's it's a it's a skill, right? You have to be able to separate your work from yourself, right? Because that's the only way your work can grow. Yeah. You know, if you're holding your work back, if you're getting defensive about critiques and things like that, you're not going to get better as a designer. So you really need to train yourself to like separate it and look at your work objectively, listen to feedback objectively. Yeah. Um, I mean, even the haters. I mean, the haters got something to say. <laughs> and you got you to gotta at least take that and right. see if, it's, if, it's this, if there's a nugget of, of value that you can take from that. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, maybe I've said this on the pod before, but it's kind of one of the reasons that I started I Draw on Receipts, my Instagram, was with this idea of like letting go of my ideas, 
because like in the beginning it was all about drawing on the back of receipts or napkins or whatever right. and and leaving them behind i left them behind wherever i was at the restaurant yeah so like that that was a deliberate attempt for me to be able to let go of the ideas and be able to take the feedback better yeah. than i had before that's a good yeah that's really cool so anyway um i should have prepped you guys but uh we every week we like to do questions. Yes. Normally people email in questions, but you guys need to start thinking of questions right now because we're going to ask for questions right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, it's time for questions. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions right off the bat, Tyler? Yeah. Uh, so you talked about like taking critiques, but maybe like what are like, you know what is a good critique? Like how do you give good critiques? Mm. Right. Oh yeah, we missed that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thank thanks, you. Tyler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tyler mentioned that we just talked about getting critique. Yeah, and we just hired Tyler as our producer just now. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I wasn't aware of this. Yeah, Ben <laughs> benefits and everything. Um, uh, we talked about taking good critique, but how should we give critique to others? Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's... You know, it is a difficult thing to give a critique, especially because as a as a good critiquer, you essentially when when I would be critiquing somebody's work, I'm doing it because I want them to take that feedback and strengthen their project. Like it is right. as as I'm doing it, it's like a, an extending of my hand to be like, let me help you to like find what is great about this project and bring it out. And so I think like, I don't know, I think that that comes across with your tone and like really subtle things. Like it's, it is kind of a subtle art. I, I agree. I think it is an art form. I mean, it's almost, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's like a conversation art. Right. You know, it's like, um, I, I think a good technique for sure is to, pick out the good part yeah about the about the design like you know praise that be like hey this is this is where you're doing a good job and then you know set that aside and then talk about the parts that need to be proved right you know I, as long as you're not saying like hey this whole thing sucks like <laughs> just go home <laughs> like i think yeah that's a bad critique right. it doesn't help you right you always need to have some sort of uh, helpful feedback that you know, maybe it's like, hey, maybe you could improve it this way. Or yeah. This. And I think uh, I remember my my dad talking about one of his employees in this way who was a manager of people. And he said that this guy was really good at having a conversation with someone and getting them to arrive at the idea that he wanted them to arrive to so that they felt ownership over it. I mean, that, that's kinda, that's that kinda, is like some jujitsu conversation right there. That's some like yeah. mind reading. Kind that of stuff. is, it is amazing. But if you, if you can sort of like lead that person to be aware of like where the pitfalls are in their portfolio by just like asking questions, maybe that's a good way to critique that, as well. That could be, that could be an effective way right. to like, to make it less about like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And more just like what, you know, what are you trying to communicate here? Like, you know, and maybe, maybe that's more helpful. Yeah. Great, great addition. I yes. appreciate you. Thank you very much. Tune in for that. Yeah. All right. So when working on my portfolio, it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed by the number of things that I'd like to do with it. Right. And so I find myself just jumping to the easiest details to fix, right? Which isn't always the, maybe the best method. Do you have any suggestions on developing a good workflow for fixing up your portfolio? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And the question was, when working on your portfolio, you've been jumping around to maybe the smaller, easier details first. Mm. And uh, what are some... <laughs> <laughs> Someone just whispered minor nice. details. <laughs> uh, what are some some ways to kind of, I don't know, focus more? Right. Some... I mean, oh. I, ha I have some thoughts. Okay. If you have thoughts Take too. Take it away. Okay. Uh, I think I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to get rid of all the extra, 
I mean, we've talked about this in, in episodes before, but just get rid of all the extra graphics and things that aren't necessarily... If you are a graphic designer, yes, your portfolio should be graphic design. But if you're an industrial designer, your portfolio should be showing off the product. Like, right. We don't need crazy graphics and things coming in here. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's my opinion. There's many ways to construct a portfolio. And right. there, if you are good at graphic design and industrial design, I've seen some crazy, amazing portfolios that have been you know nicely designed absolutely but if you're struggling with like getting distracted by those graphic details or some of those things that may not be necessary it might be something that you should just simplify cut out some of those those unnecessary details um and focus on the bigger like story right your portfolio yeah i will say also you need to make sure that your portfolio is like readable in five seconds mm. uh, i mean that's that's how long people are going to look at a portfolio. Yeah. If they like something, then they'll dig deeper and l- listen to your story. Right. But you got to make sure it's out there and yeah. flashy. At yeah. First. One thing that Reed was saying on the last podcast is like, if that, if the first page of the portfolio isn't kind of like eye catching, that's what I heard it from. Yeah. It's, I, I just, it's also <laughs> you heard it from our podcast. Yes. Well, <laughs> Last podcast, last podcast was the first podcast that I wasn't on. Right. And so it was kind of fun to listen to my own podcast. Yeah. And I could actually, like, I actually can give, like, a, a feedback on my own podcast now. Right. Yeah. But before it was, like, it's me and you. Yeah. But I separated myself for a second. Yeah. Um, but, but some advice that I have for, yes. for that kind of thing is um, I find that Sometimes when you're working within the same document for too long, like you, you start to just like really move things. So like minutely. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's just really effective to start a brand new document oh, and just start throwing stuff in because then it seems daunting, but cause then you can, I, I know it seems daunting, but like, and I'm talking about like very crude, like you can like even at the start of, um, putting together your portfolio, if you can just start throwing images in and composing them like roughly before you start getting really finite with, uh, with the way that you're moving things around. I, yeah, a fresh document to me can mean that I, I approach it in a completely new way. Yeah. That's cool. Um, That's good. And and will get me away from, I also say if you have too many projects, maybe you need to cut out some of the weaker projects. Yeah. That could help too. Yeah. Help you focus. Great question. How do uh, you wait, Nick? Yes. I'm curious. How how do you like to structure a portfolio in terms of like the strength of project or oh, the type that's of project? A good one. That's a good one. Uh, I always have my best project first, and then a a, a, a good ending project. Um, that's how I had it when it, when I graduated school. Now it's on my website, and I guess I just did have, you say best first. Best first, best project first. Mm. Like the first thing you see should be like the best thing you've ever done, mm. in my opinion. Hmm. Um, because again, it's like the five second thing of like, oh, you know, this person's going to, an employer is going to look at this thing for five seconds and I want them to see my very best. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if it catches their eye and they see the whole portfolio, I want the end project to be strong as well. So it's like, oh, yeah, this stuff is great work. Let me just write this down or something. Right. Um, that's how I structure it in terms of like type of project. I don't, I don't really know. I yeah. mean, it, it really depends on the, and also I haven't constructed like a PDF portfolio in a long time. Yeah. But, uh, for my website, I do have all my favorite projects at the top and thinking about type of projects. I also have all my, my type of projects that I would like to keep doing at the top. Oh. So like my pet projects, which, you know, are fine, but I don't. I've done a lot of that. I would like to do some other stuff. Right. Those are at the bottom. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of always approached it as like, which skill set do I want to highlight? And, and so like, wait, is your portfolio broken up in skill sets? Some, some of them, did you have like some a of the iterations page? were, it was like, it was like, yeah, one, one project would be very sketch heavy. One project might be more model heavy. That's interesting. Um, but I don't know that that was necessarily the way to go. Yeah. Um, I think that might have been school based. That feels a little more school based. Yeah. Mine, my school is very project based. Yeah. But okay. I, but anyway. Also, I will say, I will note if you guys have questions, it doesn't have to be re- related to 
portfolio critiques right. or it could just be design or life or whatever. Yeah. It's free game. We usually vet the questions on our email. So you guys are you guys can ask away. Yeah, we've answered dating questions <laughs> before. So, yeah. Yes. Mm. Oh, that's a that's an interesting question. Yeah. So, when you finish a project, how how do you start putting it in your portfolio? Is that is that correct? Um. Yeah, I just procrastinate as much as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, you don't procrastinate that much because you I, get it done eventually. Yes, I don't think I've updated my website in a year or yeah a half. I, the last thing I did was the birdhouse. Hmm. I think I think maybe the way to go, the first step I would probably do is get sort of what I think I need, the imagery I think I need together so that I can start placing images. Yeah. And then like through that process, you'll realize that you probably need to go back and get other imagery together. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just had to go and then and you do it. And then you finish your portfolio and die. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just to just to give maybe some more helpful <laughs> feedback. Uh, I, I definitely think the first step is to do photos. So uh, take photos of your models or do renderings of your your final design. And you know, I think once you start getting photos again, like you said, you realize, Oh, I actually need this photo. So you'll probably have to like reshoot some photos. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also think after you do that, then you kind of think about the story and you figure out where your sketches are, and right? You compile those and you figure out where your models are. You compile those. Yeah. And you, and you build that story that way. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, one thing just struck me about portfolios and portfolio reviews is it's it's interesting that I don't think that I ever practiced showing my portfolio before a portfolio review. And sometimes just like talking through your portfolio can expose the mistakes. Or I mean that's a where great, you can improve. That's a great feedback. I we had a portfolio class. Did you guys have a portfolio class? We had a portfolio class, but I don't think we ever uh maybe we did present our work. Part of, part of our class was, I think, near the end of the class, we would sit down with another student and present like we were presenting to an employer. That's cool. So, yeah, you know, find a friend and present to them. Yeah, because, yeah, just talking through it, you will you might come across, like, what you need to improve before right. even coming in front of. And, and building that story like we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. but... Um, but yeah, I think I think gathering your imagery together and and starting to place it, uh, like, I mean, you could even start sketching out thumbnails of what you might imagine each spread looks like. That that helps me as well. I I even sketch out thumbnails for like photography or renders, mm. so that you know where to place like you know three D models or how to kind of compose an image. Yeah. Questions? More questions? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. As a student, there's always something new to learn. Yeah. But once we're professional. And there's somebody there to teach you. Yeah, there's someone it, there to teach you. Sometimes. <laughs> I, I would hope so if yeah. you're a student. Yeah. <laughs> once you're a professional, what do you do? Well, How do you keep learning? How yeah. do you keep improving? I mean, some companies, they will put you through training. Like, I, I've known many companies to put their employees through SolidWorks training. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, when it comes to things that your company wouldn't necessarily, you know, pay for you to learn, that's that's just kind of up to you. It, it is very much on you. I mean, yeah. there's I know plenty of my friends who work at companies and they're just happy just working. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's fine. You know, I, everyone has a different path in life. I think, you know, for me personally, I like to learn a lot through like personal projects. So that's that's a good way for you to learn a new skill if you want to like. Learn how to do 
3D modeling. Try building a project around a new 3D modeling software. And right. Yeah, because I, I, I think the flaw when people go to learn some a new skill is they just Google a YouTube video and try to try to learn it. But what you need to do is you need to have a goal. Oh. Right? You need to have a project or something you're working towards. That's cool. Which helps you learn the program. Yeah, I never thought of it that way because I often find myself being like, I need to to just YouTube, 3DS YouTube Max tutorials, <laughs> Fusion, and just go for it. Right. And but it's I just do, like, yeah. But I do. I think that's really great advice of yeah. of formulating a project around learning that yeah. software. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. Could just be like the Render Weekly projects. You know. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can pay us later. <laughs> I thought we were paying. We were paying him. Oh no! Okay. This is just um, getting confusing. <laughs> Great question. Qu another question? Yeah. Um, so when we get to set up portfolios out for people, whether they're hiring interns or not, a lot of times they offer feedback and it's super helpful. But I've been in a few situations where there are differing opinions on what I should do with mm. a certain project, and these are all professionals. And <laughs> right yeah yeah put their names down on post-it notes put them up on a dartboard <laughs> no <and> just <laughs> yeah that's no. a great great question it's the, the, that's a tough that's a tough one yeah the question is is if you send out your portfolio you get a bunch of great feedback from great professionals and they have contradicting feedback you know each one has a different thought on your project what do you do right i guess it i mean I, i'll tell you what i would do yeah go ahead i would just do what i wanted but <laughs> but I, I i do think that like you have to like think down inside your heart and be like oh you know listen to your heart that that one feed that one guy that gave feedback i like his f feedback best and i feel like that's the one you should go with just yeah. like do the one that's like in your heart. I it's guess like the it, intuition thing, you know? Yeah. I guess it also depends on which company you want to work for and choose that professional. <sighs> I, I mean, I, I, are I, these, are these like rejection emails or are they? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say choose, choose the professional at the, the company that you probably like re would respect the best. I, I don't know. I, I think that, that there's probably like a quality threshold there. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, you could analyze it all you want, but I think I would just do what you right. what's in here. Yeah. Or just take, take yeah, I, I don't know. I think that there's a good argument to be said that like, if there's somebody, if there's somebody that you sent your portfolio to that you like really admire or you really admire the company that they work for and like that is the aspiration for you, like choose that company, choose the one that's like the real, like that is what you would set your sights on. And I think if that was the company, you would feel the same way about that critique. It'd be like, oh yeah, their critique is the right critique. Right. Because it's like, that's what you aspire to be. Right. So I think that might be a way of sifting through it. Also, I, I don't know that any feedback, if you filter it the right way, will be detrimental to your portfolio. But I can also understand like, overload yeah so maybe yeah just choose one see what happens i don't know yeah i guess you could always change it yeah it's not sentence you can o yeah you can always go back to how you had it yeah great question yeah yes um i'm guessing a lot of teams have this question as well when moving from like a position of a student or like a lower level designer uh into someone who has a little bit more weight to their opinion how do you start having conversations like I'm not just sort of like this person who's there for your skill set. Like someone hires me to do design work, mm. it's really just CAD work. Mm. I want you to make it like this, and make it like this, and make it like this. How do you sort of make that leap from I'm just here for my skills, now I'm here for how I think? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you start doing that with clients and making that clear? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, how, how do you go from that CAD monkey Mm. to that Johnny Ive. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very like <laughs> broad statement. But but you know, how how do you go from that that You shave your head, Nick. <laughs> That's, That's That's what true. you do. That's true. 
How do you go from that junior level position of, of doing more of the grunt work to more of that senior level kind of visionary work? Right. I honestly, I don't know how you do it without first proving that that's a part of your skill set. Like going into that, that first meeting that you have to review your work and showing that you're, you're not just executing like you're, you're thoughtful about your work. Exactly. Yeah. I think when you are doing that grunt work, when you're doing those sketches, when you're doing that CAD, you are still doing the visionary work. Right. I mean, yeah, there might be someone that's above you saying like, Hey, this is what you should do, but you're still the one creating it. And if you want to add your little thumbprint in there and in the meeting, be like, Hey, I, I thought that your vision was cool, but then I also did this little thing. Yeah. You know, like I think that shows initiative that shows that you can think higher. Yeah. I also think it's, it's a, a just a time thing it just comes with time over time. You, you know, people see you, you do more work, you gain more knowledge. Right. And yeah. And the other thing is, is like, if you're getting recommended for work, like, that's when you can come into some place and people will, will see you as not just somebody who can execute. Like you've been recommended by somebody that they know that they respect that you do good work. Yeah. You know, that's just going to like lend to your gravitas. Right. And that's just all about building up your network over time. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Mm. Oh, that's a deep one. Yeah. What What is the most fulfilling part of being an du- industrial designer? Oh, man. Oh, I got to like <laughs> just, just breathe <laughs> for that one. Oh, man. I guess where do you find meaning? Yeah. Like yeah. Where do we find meaning with our all of our projects? You know, I think deep down inside for me, I I think I find fulfillment when... When you create something and you're really proud of it and you're really excited about it and you give it to someone and it puts a smile on their face. Mm. I think that's kind of the the essence of where I find meaning. I mean, deep down inside, you know, I would I would you know, I hope that it helps and helps improve their life and and you know, saves the world and all that. Right. But like I think at the core it's like I just want people to have that little bit of a smile on their face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I would have to agree with that. I, I mean, th- I, I know that you definitely, we talk about this too. It's like yeah. with the little smile on the face type of thing. Yeah. I think um, for, for me personally right now, um, I have actually found a lot of meaning just like in what we're doing right now. And more, more educational, like educational things and talking to students, building community. Yeah. Like people reach out to me on Instagram and like going to meet up with designers because like we were talking about this earlier. The best part about industrial designers is like when you ask them about how they found out about industrial design, there's like this glint in their eye and they tell you this glowing story and you're like, that it just kind of it it kind of refuels the spirit because you're just like this is why we're in industrial design because it feels it does feel like this community yeah um, and we all have like this initiation story I guess <laughs> um, but yeah that's that's kind of where I've been finding meaning most recently yeah yeah I think that was a great question to end yes on. thank you so much that that'll yeah that'll about wrap up the podcast. Um, Thank you guys for yes. for listening live. Yeah. Um, of course, if you guys have uh, questions yourself or listening at home um, or you guys here later on, feel free. Email us at minordetailspodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, you can send in a Google voicemail. Oh, yeah. 1-646-494-4011. And uh, what else? Uh, we've got a Discord. Um, yes, join the Discord. Which you can sign up for. If you go to our Instagram page, you can click on there. And it's basically, if you don't know what Discord is, it's a it's a big chat room. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's full of people, really cool people like Dave Joseph and Tim Zarkey are in there. Yeah. 
Um, we've got a lot of like, there's some spirited conversations happening because we want this podcast to spark conversation within yeah, the community. For sure. We want to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah. And so we would like to give one last thanks to, to you guys for inviting us and especially to Henry and Tyler and whoever else helped with coordinating us coming out here. Yeah. Big thanks to you guys. Um, um, yeah. And as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out, guys. Later. <laughs>